it's it's heartening that you know Mortal Kombat is such a is such a culture a cultural you know icon that we could have went for uh, the studio could have went for for the lowest common denominator but it didn't. There's a great story. It's full of heart. Um, it's full of love. It's full of uh, of diverse heroes. Um, and we did, we didn't play to the lowest common denominator. We didn't we didn't just go okay. Well, this is Mortal Kombat. Let's just punch each other in the face and then like you know have blood everywhere and have people come watch it. There's a real story there, and there's characters you care about and characters you you can identify with. Yeah, you know it's interesting for me, uh, and I say this respectfully. Um, mm -hmm. I just never attach myself to Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings or some of those mm -hmm. like fantasy films yeah. because I just saw no representation of me. I just didn't see that. Just, just for yeah. me, just for me. And I have plenty of friends who love. No, I mean, you know, I, I get it. I get it. Yeah, it's like I, I, get it. well, I can't it's, sit it's, through. It's, 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 it's hard to watch. It's hard to watch something that excludes you. Yeah, yeah, and you know. So what's yeah. cool about Mortal Kombat, even as a video game, that it was. Uh, it was diverse, but not in tokenism from the very beginning. And then my right. girl Melina, my favorite character yeah. in, in the in the movie, is a black woman. Melina was right. the best. So I'm just yeah. I'm just um I'm just I'm just super excited. I gotta ask yeah. you this: There is she been kills it too. She kills oh, it. I, C. I C. can't wait. C. C. Stringer. Yo, C. C. Stringer yo, is, uh, is the future. Makai, let me tell you, I was so into Mortal Kombat. I said, if I had a kid, I would name her Melina. <laughs> like that, that was, no. I didn't have a kid. <laughs> but that's how deep it was. I was like, if I have a kid, I'm going to name wow. her Melina. But wow. I'm not saying that sexy. They say it in the, in the, the, the yeah, video game. Yeah, Melina, yeah. but that's what I would have named her. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, okay. it's interesting. Uh, over this uh, summer, you hear about this, quote, unquote, racial uprising and Hollywood trying to do things differently and uh, trying to engage more uh, Black content creators. I'm just wondering, from your perspective, uh, do you think it's uh, sincere? I mean, do you do you think they're really committed to change, or is it the moment? You know, because I, I think about oh my gosh, his name escapes me. I'm so sorry. I feel terrible. The uh, the young man from from uh, from uh, Bridgerton, where they didn't want him to play uh, the grandfather Reggie, of Superman. <laughs> uh, Reg, Reggie, uh, Pitt, yeah, Reggie Page or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm like, Superman flies around the planet, and he can't have a black. Grant, so I wonder, from your perspective, how committed are they really to uh, racial justice in, in Hollywood like they claim they are? Well, I, 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 uh, to, to answer the first part of the question, I, I think it's sincere. I, I, okay. I, I honestly think it's sincere. And, and you said, or is it just the moment? Well, moments create sincerity. And I think that we've had plenty of moments in, this, uh, in, in the history of, of, of America that have, that, have, that have created sincerity. Uh, out of out of um, in response to racial animus, right? So uh, Hollywood Hollywood has some has some has some sociological bills to pay, right? We we it's been Hollywood has been a co-conspirator in um, in laundering America's bigotry for decades, and uh, it's done a very good job of otherizing particularly black actors, uh, black culture, uh, exotifying it or um, uh, uh, just sort of making it, just, just, just otherizing it, right? And so when you do that, you, you, you can't remove yourself from why we're having the conversation, does my life matter, right? When you've, when you've shown me as the other, when you've exotified my presence in the movie, um, for 70, 80 years when you've done that, or you've taken the, the actual black human being and then, and then whitewashed him as the character in a movie. Um, when you've done that, um, I, I, I think that there's, there's, there's not a lot of people to blame who are still in charge in Hollywood today, but I do think that they understand that their predecessors made some really big mistakes and that that is part of the reason we're having the conversation, does my life matter? Because and in, in, in the American consciousness, you know, um, particularly for, you know, uh, the majority of the 20th century, we had we had a, a very violent, uh, uh, rigid system of apartheid in America, which means that people had a very monochromatic existence. They didn't see people who looked like you or me, you know, unless they were having them carry their luggage or having them service their, their rooms or whatever the case was. But they didn't know how much alike we were 
to them or we didn't know how much alike we were to them and so on and so forth. And so like when you're when you're thinking about a lot of these characters that are canon and, 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 and just lore of, of Hollywood stories, they're 60, 70, 80 years old sometimes. And like Jimmy Olsen, who I played, right? Uh, was, was brought to the comics by Jack Kirby in 1940. 1940, everybody pretty much had a monochromatic experience. You just saw people who looked like you. Well, if we were to create these characters in 2010 or 2015, you know, Jimmy Olsen might be an Asian guy, might be Indian, might be black, might be, might be Chinese. Like, I, I don't know. And uh, might be a woman. So I, I think that, yeah, Hollywood has got some sociological bills to pay for sure. Um, and I think that um, I want to believe that, that uh, it's, it's not just a moment. I want to believe that there's sincerity in that. I want to believe that um, it's a good sign that this time the Japanese thunder god in Mortal Kombat is not played by a British guy, mm. right? I want to believe that that's a step in the right direction. You know, it, it seems like, you know, common sense to you and I, but the original Mortal Kombat movies, Christopher Lambert was Raiden. <laughs> Right. Mm. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think we are definitely moving in the right direction. I think we're definitely moving in uh, uh, a direction of inclusivity. And, and furthermore, we have to normalize diverse heroes in cinema so that so that my daughter and your daughter, Melina, one day is not <laughs> is not having the conversation whether her life matters or not. And like, I'm not saying movies can fix that. But movies are, are this are this sort of subconscious sort of entryway into having conversations in the people's homes or uh, peer to peer, these interpersonal conversations that we have. And this interpersonal conversation that we're having right now is does my life have value? That, well, that's 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 systemic. And that is and part of the system is entertainment. And part of that and part of that entertainment process is has, has been to otherize me and you and otherize people with dark skin and, and, and villainize them in some way, shape or form, um, caricatures. Uh, so I think we have to get away from that. And I think that um, you know, we, we are finding our voice as, as, inclusive, as, as an inclusive town. And I look forward to, to, to more opportunities for that. Uh, a couple of years ago, you um, nearly died. I read this about yeah, you, that yeah. you caught a parasite uh, in Africa, yeah. and you were very ill. You were hospitalized. Uh, nobody knew what was wrong. Uh, it's really a, a powerful story, and thankfully, you, you, you survived. I wanted to know, uh, before that, after that experience, what did you let go of in your life um, mm. that maybe you were holding on to or you focused on are you obsessed about that once you live through this near-death experience that you uh said you know what those things don't matter anymore what are some of the things you let go of well uh, thank you for the question i appreciate that and um also like just just to be very clear it was 12 years ago um, oh, 12 i'm sorry i'm sorry yeah no no it's fine I, i'm i listen i'm happy it was 12 years ago if, <laughs> yeah. if it were, like like if you had caught me in 2011 it, it, you'd have been like who is this guy cuz <laughs> there was a lot of ptsd after you know mm. um uh what did i let go of and what and what okay so so what, what we're discussing now is um is is kind of the topic of this book i'm writing <laughs> which is about uh agreements and um the old agreements that i had to let go of at that point and the new agreements that i had to incorporate at that point once i saw what was important, in, at least in my life, right? Um, all the things that you, at least here's, I can, I can only speak from my experience. So all the things that I thought were important uh, before I crossed over to the other side were not. Everything that I had been through, every, every traumatic event that I had been through, every traumatic intervention I had had at that point in time, every happy memory, none of it mattered. None of it mattered. You know what mattered at the end of it? It was, I didn't regret anything I'd ever done. Not one thing. I, regret, I regretted the things that I didn't do, that I knew I wanted to. I thought I had time. We all think we have time. 
we all are putting something off until tomorrow. We're all putting it off until next month. We're all putting it off until I get this or I get this or this check comes in or this comes in or blah, 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 blah. Or, you know, this relationship works itself out. We're all waiting. We're all in this constant state of perpetual want and, 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 and patiently waiting for something to change before we take action. And I learned that that's a learned patternization. I learned that that's from fear. I learned that that's from a reaction from trauma and sadness. And for me, I just, I made, I made a promise to myself, if I get out of this hospital bed, right? Like I, I'm not gonna live that way again. I'm gonna make some new agreements. So some of the, some of the agreements that I let go of were, um, <laughs> getting deep into the book now. Uh, so some of the agreements that I, I had to let go of in particular, what I realized um, were the inherited agreements, the agreements that I was, that were thrust upon me at the moment of my birth that I had no say in, nor would I probably have chosen these agreements uh, had they been offered. Meaning what comes with my blackness? I realized a lot of my time at the end of my life, when I was 28 years old, when I was looking at the end of my life, I realized a lot of my time and effort was spent in response to what America feels about my existence. Mm. And I realized what a big fucking waste of time that was. <laughs> what a big waste, of, what a big waste of time me expending my energy, my thought processes, and, and, and interacting with this mythological circumstance that, that America has thrust upon me that I'm supposed to think is the Black experience, that things are harder for me, that this, that you, you know what it is. So we have, we have all these things that we have to interact with on a daily basis, but there's causality in that because I'm believing it. So one, one of the things that, that I, I started to do was question everything, Dis, disbelief in the, in the sort of um, intrinsic nature of my relationship with my country. I started to disbelieve it. I started to question it. I started to say no. I started to, to, to realize the places where I was appeasing white privilege without knowing it. I started mm. realizing the places where I was appeasing black burden, which is the, the ugly Siamese twin, right? So you and I grew up in, in, this, in this country with um, ancestors who had to appease white privilege. And doing that, growing up side by side in that the ugly side of twin of blackness was that many of our ancestors um, amongst themselves would say, well, here's the litmus test of your blackness. And if you don't adhere to, to, the, to these parameters, then you're not black. You don't fit in. You know, we get to, the ostracized are now being are now the ones who are ostracizing somebody else. The, the people who are being otherized are now otherizing within our, own, uh, within our own communities. And I started realizing how much of a fucking waste of time that was. How much the waste of time of racism in and of itself was such a burden in the appeasement of people who, who created these rules who don't like you. And then the appeasement of people who were putting burdens upon your shoulders who needed you to be what they thought you should be. And I just found that, it, who would I be without that? And the answer came very quickly. The answer was, you would be the soul. You would be the soul that you were born here to be. You, you, would, you, would, you would be on this planet with the, with the, yeah, I guess I'll say it you will be who you agreed to be when the soul agreed to take the body mm. without the burdens, wow. without the when expectations. When is this book coming out? When is this book coming out? <laughs> this is good. Uh, we, I'm, I'm still trying to get the, um, it's, it's hard, you know, honestly, it's, kind of, it's hard to get people to, to understand what I'm saying uh, sometimes. So like, it's, it's just simplifying it. So like, I, I, the, hopefully the book comes out 2022. But it's it's called I never agreed to be black, mm. and it's what it's what I learned in that hospital bed, in my on my deathbed, crossing over to a near death experience and coming back. That everything that we're holding on to, everything that we have 
given value to or everything that has been um, um, uh, attached to our existence and attached to our experience, particularly as Black people in America, carries as much weight with it as we allow it to. Now, don't get me wrong. Dante Wright was killed last night in, in, in Minnesota by the police blocks away from where Derek Chauvin is being tried for the murder and public execution of George Floyd, meaning these police can't even keep their hands off of us when the world is watching. Mm, 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 mm. So things have to change. But the causality of that is my response is rather than anger, rather than frustration, rather than sadness, and all these things are there, all the trauma is there. Let, let, let's, let's, be, let's be very clear about that. As Black people, we have, we have that, and we have to get over that. But our energy is best used on where do we go from here, right? We know where we're at. Y'all are still killing us for no reason. We know that. And we can continue to point that out all, all day, but it doesn't help our situation. What helps our situation is making a plan to get out of it, making a plan, patternizing uh, equity, um, creating ecosystems for allies to help, right? So this is, it, it's it, the, the main thing that I learned from, from dying and coming back is that your energy is precious and it is finite. You have a battery. That's incredible. Yeah. And That's how much, have, yeah, it's, it's finite, it's finite energy. So like whatever you decide to put your energy towards is what will prosper. Mm -hmm. I know you have to go soon, but before you go, I got to say this, I want your thoughts on it. We lost the great DMX. At oh, some man. point, there's going to be a biopic. And I'm thinking, <laughs> Todd Brooks at DMX, I think it's a good I, match, I, man. <laughs> Slipping. Uh, uh, what do you uh, think? I, I, I see it. I could see you pulling off DMX. Bro, listen, that would be listen, a great listen, story. Listen, <laughs> DMX to me, okay, so like everybody talks about, like DMX is not the greatest rapper alive. I, I understand that. Everybody talks about Tupac. Everybody talks about Biggie. Everybody talks about Jay-Z, Andre 3000, Eminem. Got it. Got it, got it. Kendrick, got it. But DMX spoke to me in a way that no other rapper did. DMX was our heavy metal, right? Yes. Like, yes, yes. He was our heavy metal. And I, I liked Metallica. I liked Motley Crue. Like, I like I oh, yeah. aspects. I like aspects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> I, 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 I like that kind of stuff. Like, I grew up with a very varied taste of music, right? And so when I heard DMX, I was like, this is our rock star. This is yeah. our heavy metal rock star. Um, so I grew up just like this with DMX in my ears the whole time. Listen, I would be blessed. I would be, I would be, I would, I would honor his memory in such a way, and I would be honored and humbled. Um, you know, from your lips to God's ears to the page. I see it. We'll see. We'll see. Brother. I see it. We'll see. I see. I think it makes sense.